This video um, talks about how energy travels through ecosystems. So the first thing, understanding what energy is, coming from a, a ninth grade physical science class, hopefully we can define energy as the ability to do work. Energy is converted in multiple organelles that we've talked about this year, including the chloroplast and the mitochondria, if you remember photosynthesis and cell respiration. Throughout this year, we have used the term autotroph and autotroph being organisms that have the capability of converting unusable forms of energy into usable forms, whether an unusable form would be something like the sunlight, and those autotrophs can transfer it using photosynthesis into a stored form of glucose. Producers is basically an autotroph, but in the context of ecology, they don't tend to use autotroph. They will tend to use producer because what they're doing is they're producing that usable energy for the rest of the ecosystem. So producers is synonymous with autotroph. So that's not going to be necessarily a new definition. Um, you really would define it as what an autotroph is, which is an organism that has the capability of converting a non-usable form of energy into a usable form. So along those lines, you can see the next word, consumer. A consumer is the idea of what a heterotroph is. But in the context of ecology, they tend to use the word consumer because that's the idea of a heterotroph is an organism that cannot convert non-usable forms of energy into usable. So therefore, they must consume or gather their energy from other sources, such as the glucose in foods and other sources. There are categories of consumers. Some of these will look familiar to you. For example, an herbivore. An herbivore would be an organism that feeds exclusively on plants. A carnivore would be an organism that can somewhat uh, exclusively feed on other animals, you would say. Uh, omnivore, if it's there, is the choice that these are organisms that feed on both plants and animals. And then this fourth group of organisms are decomposers and decomposers what they do they break down organisms that maybe have died they break down the the nutrients they kind of recycle the nutrients around the food chain and that's what we're going to talk about next this this picture below is an updated picture they kind of gotten away from the idea of a food chain, where a food chain was just a linear progression of what consumes what in a series of events. But this picture is more or less a food web because they're more complex than what a food chain. You can see individual food chains within this food web, but the first thing starts with energy enters this ecosystem by sunlight. So here, this first level, this first grouping, corn, wheat, and Indian grass, those are the producers. So they convert the sunlight into a usable form. So the arrows are pointing to organisms that would be the organisms that feed off. So look at the arrow the organ that's pointing to the organism that is feeding off of the previous producer. So locusts would feed off of wheat and corn, quail, feed off all three of these. So a food web is more of a complex network of food chains. So you can follow one potentially from sunlight, corn, locust, locust to hawk, hawk to bacteria because the decomposers are these organisms over here. They feed and recycle. You can see, follow the, the arrows, the mold, the yeast, and the bacteria what they do is they feed on all of these organisms. They break them down into their basic nutrients, and then they recycle those materials back into these producers need more than sunlight. They need the nutrients to grow as well. So the raw materials, it just completely goes around in a cycle. So here are other examples um, of another food web. Uh, what we're going to look at here, they can take a look at the food web and convert it into what is known as a pyramid. Specifically, this pyramid would be in, an energy pyramid. So what that says is the organisms that are lower, these are the organisms that are more or less the producers of the food chain. That was the Indian grass, that was the corn from the previous example. 
they are the base of the pyramid. And what that says is they consume or have the most amount of available energy because they're the first organisms to convert that energy. What that then means is any organisms that feed off of the producers would be higher on that pyramid. They are directly connected, so that would be the, these are what are known as trophic levels. When you see a pyramid such as this, they separate the organisms into trophic levels. That's T-R-O-P-H-I-C. A trophic level is just one layer of the pyramid. So the producers are the bottom trophic level. What category of consumers would be directly above the producers? So look above the vocabulary we just learned. That would be an herbivore. So in above the herbivore in this section, in trophic level Z for this example, they would be potentially called, what are they? So that could be, con they're carnivores if they feed exclusively on these organisms, but if it was a food web and you would see that they potentially also directly feed on the the organisms in the extrophic level, then they would be omnivores. To be more generic, they are, these are the producers. Sometimes they call this first trophic level the primary consumers because they're the first organisms that are going to need other organisms to get their energy. And then the Z will be the secondary consumers. But notice what happens with this pyramid. It obviously gets um, more narrow. What that means is the energy availability is getting smaller. The general rule for energy transfer is 10%. So for example, if there was 100% energy available in the producers or first trophic level, how much would be available for the Y trophic level or the primary consumers? That hopefully should be easy math. That would be 10%. So only 10% of the energy from the previous trophic level is available. So if 100% were here, 10% would be available here. How much would be available for the Z trophic level? 1%. So that's why you don't see very many food chains that are actually very long because the amount of energy that gets lost is so dramatic that there's not enough to keep the food chain going for it wouldn't make sense to keep this chain going and going. You're not, you're losing all this energy. So the, the rule of thumb is that energy doesn't have the ability to recycle itself. So it's only a one, it goes in one direction. It goes from the lower trophic levels to the higher trophic levels. And once it's wasted or lost, it's gone forever. The only way in which organisms can gather energy is by producers bringing it in from sunlight. So therefore the non-usable forms that here, they exit. So where does that 90% of the energy go from trophic level to trophic level? It can go towards the the organism's metabolism. There's a lot of processes that it requires. So there's also um, other variations. I don't think that question would ever ask you that, but it's just if you were thinking, well, where does the 90% go? Just understand it's a general rule, 10%. So they might not give it to you in percentages. They might give you it in terms of the amount. Say they said a certain number of joules of energy is available. Then what you would have to do is just take 10% of that, and that's how much would be available at the next trophic level, so on and so forth. So what other things that happen, this general pyramid takes similar shape when it talks about what is called biomass, the amount of an, that trophic level on Earth. So if we look at the complete mass of all producers on this planet, they would outmass organisms that would be classified as primary consumers. Primary consumers would outmass those that would be classified as secondary consumers. So this same pyramid is somewhat interchangeable with multiple um, variables. So we have energy pyramid. This could be also a biomass period. Often they even sometimes look at it at population size. The amount of organisms that are producers outpopulate those that are primary consumers, which outpopulate those that are secondary consumers. Here you have an example um, of a graph that is often shown in pictures for test questions. This is a relationship between two organisms, A and B. So what I'd like you to do is look at the sheer population size. And what we have to say is what is the relationship between organism A and organism B? So what you do is I want you to look at this and identify which do you think is the predator, which do you think is the prey? 
So pause that, come back in a few seconds. So if we said that the prey is going to be letter A, let's look at why that makes sense. So as A is going down, B is going up because the more predators are consuming, then the more the prey are declining in rate. But if they start going too low, then what starts to happen? The predators start to kind of have a secondary effect of that is that maybe they realize our food is going. So then what starts to happen? You can start bringing in natural selection and things like that. So then the prey start to rise in numbers because the predator is going down. So this relationship is very common. They often do this with an example of a moose and a wolf. Some students have an issue with not knowing which one. That's a somewhat common example. And unfortunately, the test makers make you assume what is that's a scenario that you would understand. But students often think that the moose is the predator because it's just larger than a wolf, but it's the reverse. So this might be an example of A would be the moose, B would be the wolf. So you would kind of explain that across the years. All right. And once again, here is another food web. So I want to show you different pictures because you will not experience the same picture over and over again. So here you have the examples that I talked about, the terms that I was using. Sorry. I'm trying to get this. Producers, you can see energy transfer. Energy is only going to go in an upward motion. But what is important is to understand, even from that food web, I kind of alluded to it. Nutrients have the ability to recycle. So these tertiary consumers, they have the smallest trophic level because they have the least amount of energy. They have the least amount of biomass. But what they do is when they would be decomposed, the nutrients will recycle. So it's that whole circle of life. This, the circle of life does not allude to energy. The circle of life rev revolves around nutrients. Nutrients don't really leave. The decomposers are there for a reason. And what they do is they just recycle that, the nutrients back into the soil. The soil can then be absorbed um, into the producers. And then those producers can kind of be consumed by the primary. So that's the whole idea. It's like the whole Lion King. Perfect analogy. All right. Um, I think that's what I'll do. I'll stop there. All talking about energy. There's a lot of questions on it. So there's a, you know, make sure that you understand that fully. You can take a, a look at your, your textbook for more information. But I think that's a good brief introduction to energy in an ecosystem.